many days we've been on tour now. Four. And for well, hell. <laughs> well, actually, we did four last week. We are up in three, and then we come back for four months. Is that what you do usually? Or do you just space it up? Uh, usually, about uh, four is the most we do at once. You said you're going to be recording for yeah, we start tomorrow. Tomorrow. That's pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty soon. Uh, for electric. Yeah. Are you happy with electric as a company? Brand new machine. Because they feel that they, you know, they signed us when we were nothing, so they deserve something. Now we feel that we made the whole company. So. That's pretty much true because, uh, you know, see the size of their office, man. You got, you got the single distribution going for them, I know that. Yeah. Because before that, they didn't have single, they had singles, but they had no distribution. You know, stuff Plus the European yeah. But, you know, yeah. and but we're really, uh, we're not unhappy with the last one. Mm. Does Rob Child uh, do much of the producing, like on uh, Horse Latitudes? That was a lot, most electronic track, wasn't it? Engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, Haney was it? No, Botnick. Botnick. Mm -hmm. very, very good engineer. Mm -hmm. What does he do in a case like that? Does he prepare a track and then uh, tape loops and things like that and then say, okay, here, is this all right with you? And then you make the changes. Um. He, all I remember is that he just came up with a sound. Kind of like trying to see. Yeah, that really scared the shit out of me the first time I heard it. Was a few people told me. Yeah. I heard it on your phones and just, you know, oh, yeah. at night, very late at night, you know, it was dark out. Right? Well, we just had a bunch of people in the studio and we just rattled on chains and bang. Yeah, we first we went out and uh, we played on the other side of the piano and the other side of the harpsichord. Mm. Yeah. Are you going to be doing more tracks like that? I haven't written any. <laughs> I don't know. It's possible. I haven't written any chain. Chain, chain, chain. I think we'll probably do sound effects. But, uh, I don't know if we'll get into more tracks. Mm. Uh, I'm just curious because, like, you know, Hendrix on his LP, you know, has got it really into that electronic bag. You know? yeah. yeah. What's this thing called Texas Radio I keep seeing and hearing references to? Oh, really? Is it a song? No, it's just a poem. And, uh, I heard a, a, a gospel hour thing in St. Louis this morning. It might work good as a uh, kind of imitation on tap. Oh, we might have one on the next album. Mm -hmm. if, if we do a live album, we'll do a long one called The Celebration. Not on one side. Is that the one that was the poem on the last <clears throat> Are you going to be doing a live album? That's something I've heard announced a couple times and I was looking yeah, forward to. Yeah, probably after this next one. Mm -hmm. Sorry to say. Should be number five. Is there any special problem with live albums? I mean, why you haven't done yeah, one we, yet? We take the Hollywood Bowl. Mm -hmm. nothing, nothing elaborate, technically. And uh, a couple of the songs sounded very good. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I know Electra may be a little scared on that because uh, they, first, they tried to record Butterfield Live mm -hmm. when they first got him down to Google. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had 
I don't know, I think they spent ten thousand dollars and they couldn't get usable tapes. Yeah. They couldn't get any kind of separate they're, yeah, they're recording a lot of people live these days. Mm -hmm. In fact, they did a group in Detroit that took a uh, lecture. Yeah. Like in the last couple of weeks, they went down to Detroit because the group was like really big in Detroit and not big anywhere else. Mm -hmm. They said they could record them live and put an album out and make their money back from that from the recording just in the city of Detroit and then they mm. expanding. Yeah. Starting to get on the old regional shot like singles used to be. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> yeah. So you're satisfied with Rothschild as a producer? Well, How much does he contribute to the sound? I mean, do you present it pretty much with a finished product and it's just his job to put it down on tape? Well, once you get into the recording studio, you know, it's the four of us, the producer, the engineer, and anyone else that works on it, like bass players. I mean, once you get in the studio, I think we can't really separate as a real team We can't separate anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, when we're on stage, it's just totally the four of us. When we get into the studio, it becomes a team. Yeah. You used uh, Luban mostly on bass. Is that how you say it, Luban? What's, what's the new guy's name? Harvey Brooks. Harvey Brooks. Harvey Brooks. Oh. Harvey Brooks. Harvey Brooks. Oh. Harvey Brooks. Oh. He's very good. First time I had an interview with a guy on the telephone yesterday, and he asked about bass players, how we, what we do for the bass sound. So I said that we use a, a different bass player, bring somebody else in. And he said, well, you know, he said, I know a guy in New York, if, you're, if you want to use a really good bass player on your next album, you have to look up Harvey Brooks. <laughs> when I told him we were going to use him, he said, oh, I knew it, I'm psychic. <laughs> 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 the, the way I first heard Brooks was uh, at Dylan's sessions for Highway 61. It was, uh, there was this guy sitting out in the studio, this sort of weird cat wearing a t-shirt and shades and a little funny goatee, you know. Yeah, and so, so, you know, all of a sudden, everyone realized that no one knew him, you know, and people were starting asking, who's that guy, you know, is he a friend of yours? No, is he a friend of yours? No. And everybody <laughs> finally said, uh, somebody went out to him and said, uh, say, uh, you know, what are you doing here? <laughs> he said, well, uh, Al asked me to come down, Al Cooper. And so they, they had a session bass player there who was really terrible, you know, he just got some really ugly shit. And uh, the next day, you know, uh, you know, Bob said, is he good? And Al said, yes, and he said, okay. And so the next day he showed up, and he did the forest till he sent me the whole thing. <coughs> it's really weird. Paul Williams told me that he did the, uh, or he helped with the rifle shots on the Unknown Soldier. <laughs> 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 yeah, he did. He was the only one that couldn't quite get him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because uh, we were the, I was in New York about the time, just in fact, the day the third album came out was the day I left New York. And, uh, he just was stopping by to drop off some stuff and he had it with him, so he listened to it. Came to that part, you know, and he went, it was since my record debut. <laughs> yeah. How's that magazine doing? Well, I'm going to have to have a little Which help one? setting it down someplace. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're going to block your guard. How about a rotation? Shed Helms is editing it now. It's a hit there. And I brought James to Bruce. Paul Williams has gone out, he's yeah, moving somewhere in California without a phone. And supposedly writing a novel. And apparently there's what he says he want to get he wants to get away from his new music bag. And get into uh How about right there? You know, more more avant garde things. So he's Helms is editing it. And there's mustard, there's ketchup, and say on the turkey sandwich we didn't have any more wheels. That's all I really care about. Just wanted the bread. That's the rough thing you're doing. You're going to seclusion and I'm sure you're going to run in. Yeah, see it down there.
I don't know if he announced it or if somebody tracked it out of him or something. You know, type of thing. He's sort of an amazing little cat. This is background. It came from a, a Eastern Yeah, Swarth, Swarth, Swarthmore, something like that. Pennsylvania, I think. And, and he was around Boston for a while because they used to see me play gigs in Boston. He'd be in the front row going. You know. He's really a nice, enthusiastic audience, you know, he's fun to play to. I pick him yeah. out in front and play. I remember him on Dean. He had a, one night I was down to the uh, Gogo with him, the airplane was, you know, doing their first gig in New York. And he was like down on his knees in the aisle, with his eyes closed, swaying back and forth, clapping his hands. And the manager says, you know, hey, come on, cut it out. That's what do you mean, you know, they need encouragement, you know, this is, you know, this is a bad scene, they need some encouragement, you know. Where are they from? At the Go-Go. go Yeah, Howard Solomon. And Solomon says, you have to cut it out, you have to leave. There's a big screaming fight, you know. Pay attention to the plane. The airplane. It was really a cold scene. You played, uh, have you played the book? Just the scene, mostly? On the scene. Mm -hmm. How was your uh, overseas tour? It's really good. London was the best. But at the Roundhouse was it? Yeah, they really liked it. Mm -hmm. The rest of it was neither here nor there. Oh, so. mm -hmm. well, that Limited enthusiasm. No, actually. You guys keep saying that. In Scandinavia, they. Well, they dug it, but they didn't understand. Oh, okay. I mean, it's like, let's see, what kind of small town I was? I think it was like playing Canton, Illinois, you know, like high school kids that were. I don't know. I don't know. No, there was a lot of kids there that, you know, they were, I knew it was happening. Well, I got the idea they, they didn't like it or dislike it, but they, they weren't going to, they didn't know, they didn't know how to express it because they weren't about to say, you know, this is. Yeah. They weren't ready to do that, but they weren't ready to figure out what, you know, what they really thought about it. In the English uh, press I've been reading, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of very nationalistic feeling. In other words, they're very much against American groups. They keep putting on anything underground or avant-garde and say it's a load of rubbish. we got groups that are ten times better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought these were cheeseburgers. Well, there's, um... They have an inferiority complex. Mm. Although they did have some really good groups there. Yep, no, we've never heard of over here. We saw Who impressed you particularly? I can't even remember the name. The Nice? The Nice is pretty good, yeah. Mm. They go in a lot more for uh, theater and showmanship in England, don't they? Mm -hmm. I mean, rather than as opposed to just standing and playing. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. admit there's parts of Crow Daddy that I've read. There's one interview of a Hendrix, one review of a Hendrix record I've read four times, and I can never read it all the way. I mean, I can never find out what's happening. It just keeps spinning me off the page. You know? I have no idea what it's about. It's like those, you know, uh, French film magazines, you know, that are so involved that uh, you have, by the time they're translated, you have absolutely no idea what the guy's talking about, if, if he did in the original. Yeah, usually the the review is just an excuse for uh, an errand of someone's personal philosophy about anything. Really? You still uh, involved in any film work? No, just not really. 
ที่Well, whatever happened to that uh, film that New Earth did for one of the tracks in the last album? I don't know. I saw a rough cut of it. I don't know. It was just eight millimeter. Right. I think it was an upgrade to 16, because I saw it at uh, Penny Baker's in New York. Did you like it? Yeah. I never saw any of the others, but I saw that one. I think it was Not to Touch the Earth. Was that it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was one of the longer tracks. I, I hadn't heard the album at the time before it was out, and I just heard it that once, and it was the end of sort of a weird day. Have you seen the work lately? I hear he cut an album. That's what I started trying to track him down. I got a friend in California looking for him. Was it probably an album? I don't know if it was a lecture or who, but singing and rapping. Really? I'd like to hear that. Oh, I gotta hear that. I've got an old tape of him doing a song called Cowboy Boots. Mm -hmm. I used to run around around in my cowboy boots and going down to Hollywood in my cowboy boots. <laughs> I'm gonna get married in my cowboy boots. I'm gonna be a great screen lover in my cowboy boots. It goes on for like 25 minutes. Sounds like Tear here. Has any of the uh, promo films ever been on TV? Like, you know, oh, Universal yeah. Soldier? Yeah. London, they really did the Unknown Soldier. Yeah. Mm. Some TV couple times. Mm. Oh, yeah. They've got more uh, market for it. They're more pop shows, don't they? They got less TV. They got less censorship. Mm. Mm -hmm. They've they got less there. money to put out the bullshit TV shows that the Americans do, so they grab hold of something that's interesting and put it out. Mm. Plus, they dig anything vaguely anti-American. <laughs> <laughs> Where else were you besides London? Frankfurt, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, and Stockholm. How was Germany? Noel was telling me some. Noel uh -huh. Reddy was telling me some pretty Amsterdam. horrible stories about it. Yeah, it's well, not He said it's worse for an Englishman. It's like if you're English in Germany, they just want to kill you flat. Mm. Really? There's nothing happening. Oh, they dig the Beatles. Like Copenhagen and Stockholm have, you know, underground and all that. Germany is just nothing. Mm. Seems like in Germany they don't. They don't care that much about Vietnam because they have the Berlin Wall and all that bullshit. Oh, yeah. Think about it, you know. What sort of material for the next album? Anything? Uh, any departures? <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, probably a lot, but I don't know whether <laughs> we're gonna do it. Mm. You know, it's like we're gonna find out when we get into it. How many sessions does it usually take you to do an album? Is there any such thing as a usual? You're supposed to be about three weeks long again. Mm -hmm. Second one took about three months. Third one took about six months. Yeah, yeah, it keeps taking longer. That's what I noticed, man. The first one we just went in and we did it in like eight straight hours. Right. <laughs> the next one it was uh, three sessions of nine hours each, and then it kept getting longer. We're hoping with Harvey that the tracks will come real quick. Mm -hmm. He's a very intuitive cat. Everyone gets a beautiful sense of their own importance. So instead of taking a third take, it has to be a seventh take. Mm -hmm. Do you do any tracks uh, live, or do you do all the vocals overdub? Both ways, more and more later. Mm. Was the end done live? That one was done live. Mm. 
Yeah, it felt it felt to me like it was when I heard it because everything just you know so much together, the kind of yeah, thing that you don't get. Yeah, I really did. The first album is still, I think, you know, my favorite of all of them. I like all of them. I, I think the ends. We did. A, we have a version that was recorded at the Hollywood Bowl. I think it's, it's like the end a year later. It's mm. very interesting. Yeah, that's that's one reason, you know, I was trying to get Elector to do a live LP of Kerner. We've seen Kerner live, and you know the difference between his recordings and the way he does it live. It's just something you can't get in the studio, yeah. but they would never do it. <laughs> yeah. Really? Kerner gets a little raunchy sometimes. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> well, one, t one time... He and me, before a gig, went to see uh, some quote, underground, unquote, movies at a local film society at the university. And they're showing uh, Scorpio Rising. So he was doing Duncan and Brady. Do you know the song? It's uh, like Duncan, Duncan and Brady was Tend and Bar and Bobby mm -hmm. But Anyway, he does a long intro, a very long story about uh, all these guys, how Brady owned the only uh, bar in town, and everyone lived in the town except for one man, and that man was a sheriff, and he lived down at the place at the jail. And he'd go to the jail, he'd sit there and say, well, what am I going to do tonight? And he'd answer himself, say, well, I don't know. I mean, I'll go down and bust somebody, you know. He just goes on and he just raps. So anyway, this night was the Scorpio Rising version of that. You know, with motorcycles and, uh, you know, <laughs> mustard and, you know, the whole thing. Where did he do that? It was, you know, just a local coffee house we used to work at. You guys work clubs much anymore? Is it mostly concert dates? It's all concerts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which do you prefer? Oh, we haven't done a club in so long. I don't know. <laughs> that would be now. <laughs> one one advantage clubs have is that you can you can practice for an audience, and in concerts, it gets hard to do that. Mm. So you only have about an hour. And uh, people want to hear what they're used to hearing. Mm. So you find that you have to do most of the numbers from the albums and things? You don't have to, but it makes everybody want to get Like tonight, will you be doing much uh, new material? We'll do a couple of new ones. Yeah, we'll do a couple of new ones. Do you find that you can get a better thing going with an audience in a concert or in a club? Well, but a, a concert is uh, just this crowd phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's a club, it's more of a... Um, it's more inner communication. Yeah. Yeah, I guess in a way it's two different kind of trips. It is. The, in a concert also, more stagey and uh, uh, you know, more extrovert. <coughs> more extrovert. Mm -hmm. In a club, you can almost see a bigger person. Which also, it's, yeah, the clubs are good because people dance right in front of you and they get that energy. Yeah, that's one thing I was thinking, you know, like, you know, people say that, like, for instance, it's hard to dance to Hendrix, but I get the feeling that he would prefer to be playing for the audience that's moving around and doing something instead of just sitting there going. Yeah. 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 That's one of the main differences in a concert. No one can move around and make <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Are we doing any protest, so-called protest, on the next thing? Yeah. On this album, yeah. I don't think we have any, anything we could be vaguely classified as protest. So, oh, there may, well, not protest, more, uh, more gospel type. Mm -hmm. But that's not exactly protest. Just we all want to be free. Mm -hmm. I read a thing a while back that uh, eventually we're thinking of augmenting like with a girl vocal group or something like that. Yeah, we probably might do that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the Raylettes. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Five blind boys. <laughs> Clear war series. So is it moving? Is the music moving more towards gospel, or is that just? Well, I wouldn't. I didn't. I don't mean it really sounds like gospel. It's just the, the spirit of gospel. Mm. Hand clapping. You know, we're all in the same boat. Mm. <coughs> Are you still as interested in? Uh, uh, music as theater rather than just music? Or are you getting away from that? Well, we've done so much talking about it, I guess we're going to have to come to see it. <laughs> yeah. You did in Madison. You had any more cop trouble? Yeah. Yeah, I got a speeding ticket to <laughs> Exhibition of speeding, that's just a speeding ticket. Just out of curiosity for myself, did that did that, you know, help or hurt? That bust I think if, if you only do it once, it helps. I think if you start doing it over and over, so people think you're some kind of a pervert. Mm. What is this guy? Did you lose him any gigs on a convict? I don't think so. No, no but you have a lot of trouble. Lost in the like Lost night St. Louis. Read him that writer. Well, <laughs> I got this little letter from our agency. We got it from... Uh, is it true we can't play in Phoenix? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? This is really cool. Well, that's for Green Tobin. Oh, it's not. Why? What happened? He's one of the players. He's near Ryan. Well, Jim kept saying, I want to see Phoenix flip out. Oh, yeah. yeah just, come on, you guys, you chickens. Come on, it's last time I want to be here. Let's charge the state, boys. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys are worse than newspapers, you know, because I, I didn't say anything oh, near that. No, it's still it's not like it hardly stands. It's terrible. It's just terrible stuff. It's funny, everybody had such a good time, even the cops. Yeah. I know. Everybody got beat up, but they got to push them around a little, and it was all groovy. Everybody had their rugs on. This was in Phoenix? Uh, mm. The hall has sent a special letter stating that if, in judgment of the hall manager, the content of the performance is immoral, indecent, or illegal, the show will be ended immediately. <laughs> we got that in Columbus, Ohio, and here. Really? It's, I mean, in St. Louis. See, the thing is, there's like a whole manager's association. Yeah. And they all get together and decide what groups they like and what groups they don't like. And this association sent out a letter, which I'm trying to track down, stating that the doors are troublemakers. Mm -hmm. So um, the promoters have had to do a lot of pushing and fighting to get into the halls. And they, you know, they the first no guarantees that if anything happens, they'll be sold responsible for it. They almost had that kind of problem here because of the injuries thing last week. The guy almost canceled out the hall. Because he said, you know, like there's thousands of dollars worth of damage to the auditorium, which is a bunch of shit. You know? <laughs> they don't do anything. You know? They don't do anything. The kids finally get up there, they just go, oh, you know, Yeah, so, uh, like, you know, a railing got, one of the aluminum railings got bent, you know, and a chick got cut a little bit and somebody fainted. And so, like, you know, they were doing you know, a big thing. The thing is, they always seem to hold the group responsible for that. They don't hold their shitty security forces right. responsible for it. Mm -hmm. In well, New York, they yeah, because he, he loosed the security. Harry had it, the promoter had it all set up, you know, like with guards in the aisles and, you know, facing backwards and, you know, people with, watching. With clubs and all? I don't know with clubs, but, you know, just there so that if anyone tried to charge the stage, so to keep everyone moving back instead of forward. You know. Well, we travel with our own security people to make sure that kind of stuff doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. and at least more to make sure they don't get on stage. They can charge all they want, but if they get on stage, yeah. and, you know, the group and all our equipment and everything else is a I read something about that some some cat attacked your equipment somewhere after in Long Island. Oh, well, the single bowl they were trying to run off with our amps. <laughs> Chicks, you know, one at each end of an amp. <laughs> that was funny. It was very weird. <laughs> but you know, like we've got a lawsuit pending from Singer Bowl because a cop struck this chick or something. Mm. 
you know, the, there was nothing a big until the group was off the stage. We go and off then the they stage. Ten minutes chairs. later, they started breaking chairs and going crazy, and so we got a whole bunch of trouble. We got a terrible review. Oh, we got. And that night was really weird. You know, just before we started, the big fat cat, whatever his name is. Camp. 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 Camel. 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 Oh, camel. Camel. So he comes up to me and he says, whatever happens, you're on your own. There aren't any police here tonight. And I looked around and it was like, right, it's night, you know. Yeah. But two <laughs> kids came on stage. stage. <laughs> And all of a sudden, a door <laughs> opens, and it, 20 of them come running with their hands well, on you know the page, you know, ready to do it. It all happened because, I could, well, first of all, I came up and I said, um, Boots, who are the people that are guarding this stage? There was Boots and Cam, and two cops on each side in these little rooms. And they weren't really guarding the stage, they were just kind of hanging out. But and doesn't Boots, said, Boots and Cam tell all those that's cops? That's what I, you know, I just told yeah, them. That's what I'm really going to get into it with George. I mean. Oh, you've got to. I could write him a letter about four pages long. But anyway, see, we have these two people that are supposed to. Their job is to meet with this, excuse me, the security force and set them up in the positions they want them and give them instructions on what to do if what happens. Well, we hire the private detectives on the spades. And they're intermediaries between us and well, the police. Well, that's really not long. Yeah. 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 They're really yeah. groovy. They cool them all really out and say, let them run up. And, and so we warned the police and everything, and they called in more enforcement. And we got the ushers all set up. And pretty soon we had about 10 or 15 people on each side of the stage ready to help. But that was about halfway through the set, because when it started out, there was three people on each side of the stage to push people off as they came. And the stage was like 70 feet across. <coughs> Huge stage. Hey, and I the kids are this far from the stage. The stage is that high, and there's a step right here. They get in that stage in a flash. Yeah. Unbelievable. And I just, you know, Why was the vocal PA so far away? I think that's that, what it is, I know, but this time they were really far. Well, that's because there was people all in. Yeah, that's a big place. I know, but cover a very man, wide it area. was like the PA was down the block, and we were over here. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. The monitor has to be placed differently, but those. I actually used his PA also. Yeah. The middle people, you know. Yeah. Rather than having low volume and then the in the middle feeding back, you know. Yeah. It's better to have them out of the we, we get pretty good sound in most all the halls we play. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the vo the voice is usually louder than the instruments. Well, well we, we have gigs, uh, it's been dragging. You know? Well we it's have been dragging from where you're sitting, but I have never heard the instruments overpower the voice. They don't because we have a thousand watts for the voice and six hundred watts for the instruments. It's also the audience. If they, if they keep quiet, you can hear it. You can hear a pin drop. If, if there's a lot of chatter, then it breaks it up. Do you carry your own vocal PA? Yeah. Yeah, we just you use you carry anywhere from a thousand watts to the higher volume. It's five thousand watts. Yeah. We we just did a big scene at the Hollywood Bowl. We had 54 amps on stage. Just, you know, it was a whole wall of amps. That made for a very good book. And then yeah. after about two and a half, you could have deafened everyone in that place. Really? <laughs> and probably. It was unbelievable. But now the thing is that almost any hall in the country doesn't have a decent PA for a group that puts out the power of the doors or something. Mm -hmm. Bernina Planer, Hendrix, or anybody yeah. like that. So we just have, what we use is the same things they use for instruments. They have just the amps, and it's run to a mixer and into the amps. And so you got more four on each side, four, you know, big. Two of them have two 15s on one, and two of them have two 12s on one. Mm. And it'll cover, you know, there you're matched. The vocals will cover anything the amps will. Do you mix from up front then while the show's on? You know, um, Prince mixes from behind him. I know he has the phones. Mm. But actually, he usually just cranks the voice up full blast. Yes, he just puts the voice to feet back on the instruments. But I've had a lot of times where I've had to tell this to turn up. And the voice is so loud all the time. Then we only have one voice, but most groups usually have three. A lot of groups yeah. have three voices coming to the piano. What's, yeah. your, what's your biggest single problem with tours? Or biggest single yeah, do you have one problem? single thing that you can kind of name? Traveling, equipment, boredom. people? I'd say boredom. Boredom, yeah. Boredom. All the time you spend in a room. You, you travel not 12 hours a day to get to a place where you play only for an hour. Yeah. Well, like in this tour, we're traveling from about noon till 5 every day. 
Mm. It's kind of Archivize the afternoon, but it's still pretty boring. Yeah. There's nothing, you know, what is there to do in Milwaukee or Madison or Minneapolis, right? Right. Right. So you just read magazines. Yeah. There's always the little problems in play. Do you have much equipment has generally? Uh, our contract usually covers the fact that there has to be a big truck waiting at the airport for the equipment and this, that, and the other stuff. So. Yeah, it's, no it's usually the airplanes breaking the stuff up that's the worst. Mm. <laughs> but we have a really good equipment. You ever watch those guys on the belt? Oh, God. Unbelievable. They hold the thing this far from the belt and go, <laughs> snap it down. Just break the shit out of <coughs> everything we have. Luckily, our guy is really good and he can fix almost anything mm -hmm. we've got. Yeah, Vince is the genius of the industry. Every gig we've ever played, the promoter's going to say, where'd you get that guy? Because, you know, like Robbie's amp was blown a couple of days ago, his um, Power Plus unit. Scoops, they dropped it. Every, the, all the, I, you know, I don't know what any of the stuff is back there, but all those little things in the back that are all wired together were just lying around. Vince is working in darkness by hand. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, buzz, it's on. Yeah. He's one of those people that just knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. When you write, do you just sort of write and then later sort it out and say, okay, this is a song and that's a song and this is a song, or do you sit down and write a specific song? Well, it's, um, it happens that way in a lot of other ways. Mm -hmm. I, it's always hard to remember was the song was there and how it got there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, just the ideas come from everywhere, somehow. Actually, we, you know, once that idea comes, it, it becomes a song pretty fast. It just takes a few times. Do you have an idea for, like, a melody and things or when you write? Sometimes. I don't actually... I, I did most of my writing in a short burst of a few years ago. Mm. Mm. You write words and melody both. I usually, I usually start with a melody and then get mm. the words. Yeah. Or I take some of Jim word, Jim's words and, and do a melody to it. Mm. I just like looking at um, Not to Touch the Earth, the way it was written down. It seems sort of in a pretty free form. Yeah, but in, but in the song itself it's very tight. Everything you know, the structure is very good. It flows together. Well, usually, once like the end, when the music's over, not to touch the earth, five to one, uh, uh, just are built, are built like a building or something. Just you know, all the lyrics aren't there at the beginning, or there's not a song. It just uh, there's kind of. Like, a start and then just builds. When do you get time to put material together if you're on the road? Do you tour much? I mean, when, when you're not touring, do you rehearse? Uh, we don't rehearse that much. Mm -hmm. well, for this album? For this album, yeah. We rehearsed quite a bit. Yeah, they prepared this album a lot better. This, you know, mm -hmm. We have a, a kind of a duplex office in the downstairs area as a practice area. There's been a lot more work towards getting it together before they go into the it's studio. Hard. Yeah, but that's the opposite. It used to be it, when we were playing clubs, uh, we could write songs while we were playing. Mm. You know, we can't do that as well. So we have to rehearse. You know, it's, you know, like when I was working with Dave, we would, you know, we would start to do a song and we just, you know, say, okay, E. Yeah. And we'd start doing something in E and then some words would come out and I'd, I'd remember some of the words, the key words, and I'd, later I'd say, uh, remember those words. And then the next day he'd sing a song slightly different using the same things and eventually it would evolve into a song. That's just mm -hmm. what we used to do. Mm -hmm. That's how the whole first album, you know, started. Mm -hmm. Second album, mm -hmm. How much of the end was done when you went into the studio? Was that pretty much in the studio? That was all. That was all before. Well, see, the end is in one of those songs that it has a basic framework, a skeleton, and we just, just 
concept for another time, so that was just where the song developed at that time. Yeah. So that's the hard thing. I noticed there was an interview with Rothschild and Crawdaddy, and he said that uh, the song develops that way, and then you catch it at the peak of his performance or something. And then once it's caught, it sort of tends to remain the way. Like you mentioned, that you you guys were sort of performing it more or less as it was on the record. After well, it's it still recorded. changing, really. Yeah. I think it's better We still, when well, we do correct. play it, we goof around a lot, you know, improvise with words and The riffs in there, was that influenced by Indian much? Or is it more for Michael? Yeah, I'd say it's more for me. You, you were a Michael trained guitar player, weren't you? Yeah, sort of. I mean, I didn't have any Indian trained guitar player at that time. you got a very distinctive guitar style, and everybody else is trying to sound as much like Clapton and Bloomfield as they can, you know? And uh, uh, is that due to the Flamenco thing, you think? The Indian Flamenco thing? Uh, I'd say, uh, I'd say so. I'd say one of the main reasons that I sound that way is because I don't use a pick. You don't play all finger pick? Yeah, I use a pick. Yeah. And I try to get sound, I guess. Most of my stuff I don't use the first time. Mm-hmm. Who are those people you mentioned? Clapton. 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 Well, those, they don't have organs in their groups, right? Mm-hmm. And they have bass, so that would be a difference, too. Yeah. If you have a, you know, a third, you can do a subtle. How hard is it, uh, Ray, for you to think of, you know, like bass lines uh, while you're playing right hand? Is it a hard thing to separate your head that way? No, I've always, I've been playing the piano that way, more or less, mm. for a long time. I would just sit down and play by myself, and I would automatically keep a, a beat or a rhythm with the yeah. left hand. How would you do that? The only thing that bothers me is every once in a great while, when you really get into those yeah. opposite times between one hand, like yeah. the bass is playing four, and he's going, do, 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 you know, just all over the place. And then I try to follow that bass, and that bass starts to yeah, rush a little, right. but, you know. Right. But you can't help it, you know, your mind is in half. <laughs> it's sort of like Indian music because, like in Indian music, you have to keep track of the rhythm with one part of your mind. You know, if you're the melodic instrument, like a sitar or sarod or whatever, you have to keep track of the, the tall, the rhythm, at the same time be playing things, improvisations, which end on that particular thing. So you've got to, again, segment your head then. You know, we used to do that at uh, Lenny Tristano, mm-hmm. yeah. the white piano player. Mm-hmm. Really had a fantastic left hand. He was blind. Is that blind? That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he was, yeah. Yeah. He'd do just what you do sometimes. Yeah, he'd play a real strong bass line, you know. And then he'd just play weird times and he'd just left hand. Do you guys want to go and practice or rehearse? Six fifteen. Six fifteen. How'd you know? Psychic. 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 The group with Hendrix was what, uh, Cat Mother and the All Night News. He's was. doing that. Yeah, he's producing Is it something. Is it how they go? They're not outstanding, but they're very tight. You know, they're very together, much more so than, you know, most supporting groups tend to be. We're trying to book some groups with us. They're trying to sort of educate the masses, you know. Mm-hmm. Trying to get rolling. But the these promoters are well. like scenic sound there. <laughs> I was interested in the drama. <laughs> mm-hmm. you you know, we want to get. What are they going to do? The promoter's uh, going to feel the price that this group gets, and he's not going to want to put Roland Kirk on the. Why board. not? Because Roland Kirk's going to draw about 300 jazz. <laughs> well, 
Who cares? Well, uh, Gordon cares because if he's investing twenty grand in this show, he wants to put somebody in that. But as long as we can, can go, be, he's yeah, just pretty assured that we're going to fill it. Why can't we have uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, Roland Kirk? Well, <laughs> you know, really, the bill um, for, um, really, for the really far out. Yeah, That's what I want. Thing, you know, Jerry yeah. Lewis and Roland Kirk. Yeah, but like, who are the Midwest Hydraulic Company? They're just an afterthought. Oh, right. Yeah, that's yeah, just, yeah. Well, these promoters well, that's what think the Wilton group is. Mm. No, I mean, the, we've never had the same group playing on this all the time. See, usually the promoter's position is, oh, hey, well, there's this local group, just like you're like to record in a group in Detroit. There's this local group that's big in town. Mm. And they got a lot of following. They play all the dances and all that. Mm. Yes, and they demand they either do them or that, or that they cut down the guarantees so they can pay more for another draw. <coughs> You know, I really liked that idea the other day of a, a young classical pianist, Misha Dicker. That's it. No. You think he'd do it? No, I guess not. I don't know. Somebody I might. saw him once, man. Rudolf Serkin's uh, son, Peter Serkin. <laughs> he might do it. Oh, that's ridiculous. Why, man? You should see <laughs> this guy, man. He's really oh, incredible. No, but the kids would So what? I mean, so uh, at least they might dig Roland Kirk because he's so freaky, you know. Mm -hmm. Then they might start to dig jazz or something, you know. But this guy, they're just going to sit on some piano player. Yeah, but he really gets yeah, it. He has the whole visual thing with his hair. Oh, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with his hair. That's <laughs> <laughs> getting pretty tight. <laughs> Jerry Lewis. <laughs> yeah. He... Did you see Jerry Lewis on the Steve Allen show a long time ago? Mm -hmm. Kicked the piano bench out, somebody threw it back at him. <laughs> <laughs> I cracked me up. <laughs> we were thinking of having a whole... Uh, Review, you know, from 1950 on, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. It'd be good. Yeah. What type of music do you listen to? Just for pleasure. Oh, I don't know. You know, you know lately I've been just listening to a lot of Motown. Mm -hmm. Do you have any favorites? People? Uh, nothing leaves to mind. <laughs> Has Dylan influenced you much? Are you right? <laughs> oh, excuse me. Mm. Sorry, Dylan. I hate to disturb me. Well, only in the sense that, you know, everyone that you're aware of influenced you. Mm. I would say I, I like him much more now than I did before. Because of John Wesley Hurd? Maybe that. Just, I don't know. I, the older I get, the more I like his mm -hmm. I'd say that he's, you know, we respect him so much that we would try to keep away from his sound, you know? Yeah. And it's just too, uh... Have you heard the bands, though? Oh, yeah. What do you think? Oh, you like that? Yeah, I like that a lot. I think the stone's my favorite rock group. Mm. Have you heard their Beggar's Banquet? No. Well, yeah, I yeah. have. Just on the tapes and stuff. And it's the tightest they've signed. The tightest they've ever signed. Mm. It's the cleanest, holy sound. It's more blues? Good. It's a lot of bottleneck guitar in it. Yeah, the No Expectations is really pretty. I really love him. Mm -hmm. Jagger is, I think he's a genius for phrasing. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't remember what the song is about and the ideas, but you remember phrases. Mm -hmm. You know, ways of, just ways of singing words. Mm -hmm. favorite people that you listen to? Beatles and the Stones. <laughs> 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 okay. Just everybody. Every, every, you know. John likes Albert Heinrich. Mm. I do. Albert Heinrich? Who's Albert Who is Albert Heinrich? <laughs> Jazz tenor player. Mm. Like, was that other guy? Shep. Archie Shep. Mm. I like, uh, oh, yeah, right. Holson Coltrane. 
Who said it? Uh, High and low, so sounds. Rose Kobuki? Uh, yeah. Or Sam. Would you check him to death? Sure. Brother Jack. Huh? Brother Jack. Brother Jack. Jack and Duck and Roland Kirk made an album together. Oh, really? Oh, I love it, man. You still listen to folk music much? Yeah, sometimes. I like uh, Jack Elliott. Rumbling, stumbling Jack Elliott. Yeah. Yeah, I still really dig the Turner Ray and Glover. That was just a whole other year. You know? I don't see why I couldn't come back there. Like that stuff that on the first album, I think it's really, that can be a popular Somebody story. told me, a friend of mine told me that there, uh, a rock group had done Jimmy Bell, which Dave did, I think, on his solo album. And I haven't heard it yet, but you know, it would seem to me it, be a, it could be a very good song, you know, with a group. No, that was on the first album. Was it on the first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harp? Not really. I think the best one I've heard probably is Junior Wells, but he's getting so hung up in that James Brown bullshit, you know. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's doing more dance stimmers and less harp playing. You know? What do you think of Jack Bruce's harp playing? <laughs> you want an honest guy? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, he's enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. but I don't really think he's really good because it's sloppy, you know. Yeah. He never, he never really, he's never really clean. He doesn't cut off with them. He just sort of keeps going. There's a lot of energy and a lot of yeah. sort of a speedy sound. But did you ever hear Van Morrison play on? Uh, them Mystic Guys. Yeah. yeah. The first thing. Oh, personally, it's great. I've never heard of live. It's really good. Oh, you should hear Mystic Guys the first. I love to. That's my, that's one of my favorite records here. Just, so just fuck that record. What? Only mine. No, the first one. Them. The Them's the album, not Van Morrison's solo album. No. Yeah. Are they still together as a group? Well, some of them are a uh, bass player and, and I guess the bass player is the only original one in the group left. Mm -hmm. He's going to have a band going to Texas somewhere. In Texas? Yeah. What happened? He married the governor's daughters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Did you tell me that? Somebody else told me. By the time we made it to the whiskey, the room was like the band. Ouch. <laughs> pictures when we were all playing together in that one set when we all played at once. Oh, that was really We still got some pictures of that. Alan mm -hmm. and Van used to live the same way. Jimmy Reed. Oh, yeah. Jimmy. I mean, John Lee. No, it was Sonny Boy. Sonny Boy was my idol for years. Yeah. And so I think they get the... Well, of course, some people just like to drink, especially the Irish people. <laughs> <laughs> And some people don't. 
But uh, they also get that from uh, those old blues cats that are really juicy. Yeah, Sonny Boy, uh, Robbie from the band was telling me, he, you know, one of their, Levon, their drummer, grew up in West Helena, which is where Sonny Boy did a lot of his gigs, you know, he's come back to, you know, go to Europe and come back to West Helena, Arkansas. So they go hang out with him, man, and he'd be drinking, like, you know, a pint of white lightning. And Robbie said it's like the kind of stuff you take about one shot, you know, when you're inside, you just go, Phew, and your head goes plunk. <laughs> and you'd just be, you know, just sitting there, you know, sitting like water you know, every day. I love that cover on that, one of this album, Down and Out. Yeah. Some cat lying in a doorway. <laughs> right. Where did they find that guy? <laughs> 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 Sonny Boy was really beautiful. I always wanted to meet him, and then just, you know, about half a year before he died, I found out that he was working fairly regularly in Milwaukee and Chicago, which was, you know, like about eight hours from here by car. So I decided, like, I was going to go down pretty soon, you know, go down and, you know, make a thing about finding him and get together with him. I kept saying, well, I'll do that one of these days, and i think about it. And then I found out he died. You know? <coughs> I don't know. I th he had TB. Yeah, lung congestion. TB sheets. Yeah, it could be that sometimes. <laughs> I agree. It's a very painful sound. <laughs> By the way, uh, in Marvel Comics, they have irresistible Spanish fly spray for lures for fishermen. <laughs> the ancient formula now legal for fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> Aerosol can. God. Yeah, I like this guy who told me about this, this uh, Mexican waiter. No, he's actually a Tara Himara Indian working in a restaurant in LA. He told me about this, you know, this drink, Don Yano's. It has a worm in it. And a bottle of yeah, I believe that. I've seen sake like that. So it's supposed to be an African music. Sure. Maybe if you eat more. <laughs>